Spacey Sims, and we are back with more Lucid Nine. So we are at the career fair with Yama. Uh, a nearby small group of students catches my eye. They're gathered in front of a man in a long, sweeping lab coat. He's the only one that's got a sprite. Although his voice is placid, there lies an undercurrent of power in every word he says. Life is a fragile thing. There's an unspeakable number of ways for the human body to fail, and even more for it to be broken. Death was accepted as an inevitable part of life, a natural stage in the cycle of this world. But it doesn't have to be that way. The man in the lab coat straightens as the students break into hurried whispers. Through research, we can create medicine that fights disease and treats disorders, extending our lives exponentially, and maybe indefinitely. Ah, so he's a medical researcher. He fixes his gaze on each individual in the crowd, not in a hostile manner, but certainly in an unnerving one. A day may come when we can defy death. His eyes land on me. The intelligent arc of his brow and the commanding line of his jaw shifts, shifts slightly as he examines me. I feel frozen beneath his piercing gaze. It isn't exactly uncomfortable, just strange. Eventually he turns away, adjusting the golden glasses that are settled on the bridge of his nose. If you seek to make a lasting influence on the world, join us at Way Forward Pharmaceuticals in the Research Division. Together we can accomplish the impossible and prevent the inevitable. The crowd of students breaks into applause, their faces agape in wonder. I can only scoff. No one can defy death. Anyone who thinks otherwise is just delusional. As I turn away from the Way Forward booth, the PA hums to life. Attention students, Mayor Inori will be speaking at the center stage in five minutes. The students around me gasp audibly, breaking into frantic whispers. Mayor Inori, here in person? Our school's important, you know. Why wouldn't he come? Come on, let's get a good spot. I follow the massive throng, massive throng of students gathering around the courtyard center of stage. Sure enough, Masaru Inori, the ever-popular mayor of Isa Isamu, is in the flesh. He gives the students a cordial wave from behind an impenetrable line of security guards. You know, back in my day, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, this extracts a laugh from the crowd, we always ditched career day. We'd pop over to GFC, you should have seen it before it was renovated, and stuff ourselves on wings. They were only double S's at the time. Shows you how far we've come as a society, eh? The crowd chuckles again. Among them, I catch the distinct tint of Elizabeth's giggle. As usual, she's eagerly jotting notes on her phone, hanging onto the mayor's every word. The brunette girl who's always around Elizabeth is also next to her. Surprisingly, she seems equally engrossed in the speech. And yes, I hated career day. Thought it was a waste of time. Thought that they were restraining me at, at a time when all I wanted to do was explore myself. Who I was, who I wanted to be. But later I realized that I was thinking about career day in the completely wrong way. It wasn't about deciding my future. It was about exploring possibilities. He allowed me allows a moment of thoughtful silence before he continues. The truth is, you'll probably change careers multiple times in your life. In fact, the average number of job changes is estimated to be 15 times. That's fucking astounding. You could be in med school all your life, but have experience in construction, woodworking, design, architecture, statistics, engineering, maybe even ostrich babysitting or bicycle fishing. I want to know how to bicycle fish now. Sounds fucking intriguing. Elizabeth smiles into her hand as the students laugh like a perfectly timed track. But as, a vast, but as vast as the future is, you know what you don't want to do. You don't want to be hurt. You don't want to go each day full of insecurities, doubts, fears. You don't want to be lied to or backstabbed or treated like a fake. I won't lie to you. It's a nasty world out there. But I think that we can all agree that regardless of who we are or where we're from... We each have an important part to play in the safety of this country. So go on, explore. You guys are bright. And hey, you guys are in a better spot than I was. I thought I'd like nothing more than to become an anthropologist. Not that I even knew what that meant at the time. It just sounded cool. This parting sentence elicits another laugh as he steps off the stage, offering a final wave. The students erupt into cheers in response. I quickly shuffle away from the crowd before the noise overwhelms me. I don't want to like this guy. Heck, I don't want to like any politician. But he seems to be less evil than the others I've seen. He has a very nice Mark Twain voice. Furthermore, he made a good speech. He came across intelligent, but genuine. 
two major opposites of politics. Maybe I'll vote in this re-election. Maybe. Hello, stranger! Oh? Hey, Mickey! I abruptly stop in my tracks, finally taking in what she's wearing. Well, you're dressed up. Which is putting it lightly. She's draped in a silken kimono that ripples around her figure like water. Hair insert with minimalistic ribbon and crystal pin. Oh, inset, whatever. She can own the red carpet. Or throne, even, with that outfit. Pretty. My mind supplies unhelpfully. I quickly grind that part of my mind to dust. That's all you have to say? Well, what were you expecting? Poetry? Oh, dearest, you liken yourself to starlight, with eyes like the moon and a mouth like the purest golden flame the sun air did see. She promptly slaps me on the back. Very funny, Shakespeare, too. Although I'm impressed. Your recita recitation was pretty decent. I feel like she's insulting me, but she genuinely seems shocked. So what brings you here? Do you want to become a model? Uh, what? Oh, no need to be embarrassed. Male models are hardly anything new. However, they do tend to be physically fit. Do you happen to have a six-pack? I... I'll pretend to heard none of that. What makes you think I would ever want to be a model? You're standing by my company's booth. We are a modeling company. Surprised, I cast a quick glance behind her. I know this is probably not the voice I gave to her in, like, two parts ago, but, like, I can't freaking remember what her voice was like. Whatever. I'm so bad! Sure enough, a large banner reads, Lotus modeling above a tent with striking photo spreads. Hence the kimono, I assume. You assume correctly. So where's Rui? I haven't seen her all day. That awkward moment when... Er, really? That's... that's funny. She attends this school, right? What? Of course she does. So you've seen her today. I... well, yeah. You didn't tell her about me? Hello, social drama. I missed you. Not. How can I word this delicately? Or better yet, avoid it completely. Um, you should probably be getting back to your job. I have my eye on you, Yama. Do you really think I can't tell when you're lying? I believe in my ability to run away. Always the same, I see. I've made a mental note to harass you about it later. Until then, Yama. She, fell back, she floats back to her booth, greeting any curious glances with an effortless smile. A model. Her job is modeling. Somehow I find that a little underwhelming. I almost expect her to be involved in something drastic like the Secret Service or the film industry or even the Olympics. But modeling where you pose and change and smile for hours and hours? Adventurous, stubborn Mickey? Doesn't seem to fit her. Whatever. Guess it's none of my business anyway. It's time to see Mr. Ryota. This time he opens the door as soon as I knock. I must have caught him at a good time. Well, Ishimoto, we've been expecting you. He cackles maniacally and taps his fingertips together. You should have turned in your chair while stroking a cat. Bah, everyone's a critic. Would you have rather been left standing outside in the cold? Outside? Be in the hallway. You seem awfully eager to prove your mentor wrong, boy. Well, uh, whether I prove it or not, it's still wrong, right? Ah, yes, but that would never fly in a court of law, you see. Imagine it. I declare the defendant guilty because from a metaphysical standpoint, it is true, even if we have no... Epistemological link? Epistemological link? That is a word that I have never come across before in my life. Of knowing so, I just lost you. I get that a lot. Go ahead and take a seat. We've got more important things to discuss, no? Hesitantly, I slide into the nearest couch. I've always seen Mr. Ryota as an intelligent man, even if laid back, but I never actually, well, not understood him. I wonder how much brain mass he's hiding behind that cheery facade. So, the new transfer student, Misaki Kazahaya. Kazahaya. I hope you didn't mind, I did a little look up on her. You can do that? Well, there's no explicit rule saying I can't use the confidential database. Whoops, sorry. I'm pretty sure that there is. Nope. I may be faculty, but I'm not a teacher. It's only stated that teachers have to request special permission. I check the loopholes. Something feels wrong about this. What did you find out? Well, if I tell you, then it's a solid breach of confidentiality. I don't want to go to jail yet. The food's too good here. 
Mr. Ryota, I really worry about you sometimes. And this is me talking. So instead, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the matter, Yama. How did you do me? And you mentioned that she left? Yeah. I close my eyes, letting the ever-constant hum of the air conditioner calm my nerves. Then I start talking. It's practically subconscious. My mouth dutifully repeats the train of thought running through my mind. Everything is calm, clear, slow. Therapy. Something that I've gotten used to over the years. So I easily turn my brain to the topic of interest. Misaki Kazahaya. Kazahaya. I met her when I was young. Not too young. A baby still forming thought patterns and ideas about the world. But young enough to be highly impressionable. It had been on a day when I thought nothing could make me smile. Not the vibrant lanterns strewn between the roofs of multicolored booths. Not the festival rhythms of the taiko drummers urging on the parade of light-bearing dancers. Not the stands in which a variety of nutritionally questionable foods were being served. Not even Rui. Rui, who dragged me out of the house despite my best efforts to stay miserable. It was only around an hour into the festival, but I was ready to go. When Rui went to the bathroom, I seriously considered ditching her and going back to my room. Apparently I was scowling. Deeply at that. I didn't know it until a passing girl suddenly stepped in front of me. Does your face always look like that? To say the least, that didn't help my foul mood. I glared up at her. She was pretty. Well, that was the first thought in my head. That instinctive spark of apprehension when a guy sees a pretty girl, no matter how much he wants to feel otherwise. Her hair was braided back into an elegant half-updo, light ebony curls framing her porcelain face. Big eyes, long lashes, pointed chin. The kind of traditional beauty you might see in a kimono commercial. Now we know why she became a model. Of course, the first spark of interest was immediately overridden by indignance that only an eight-year-old boy could feel. What are you looking at? Don't look so grumpy. You should be celebrating. She didn't know anything, of course, until a few months later. Festivals are stupid. They are not! Why? There isn't any, even any reason to celebrate. The girl's face twisted into something resembling anger. It looks strange on her face, like a guinea pig attempting to seem menacing. You don't even know what the festival is about, do you? Well, of course I didn't, but I wasn't about to admit that. Of course I do. Oh yeah? What's it about? Well, you make lanterns. Uh-huh. And... I fisted my hands in her condescending tone. You write wishes on them and stuff. Wrong. I am not. Yeah, you are. You don't write wishes. You write what you want to tell dead people. Ridiculous, I should have said. Why would I even want to talk to dead people? But I didn't mock it. I couldn't mock it. Dead people? Yep. I can write a message to Auntie on this lantern, and she'd see it. How do you know that? Haven't you heard the story... No, I hadn't. But my eight-year-old pride prevented me from saying that, of course. Thankfully, the girl took my silence as confusion. Well, once upon a time, there was a princess. Was she pretty? Yeah. Good at singing? Yeah. Boring. It's not boring. The indignant anger on her face made me snicker, the first time I'd smiled all day. Yeah? Well, what happens? Does she get in trouble on a charming princess to save her? Just listen! Look, she's actually a big meanie. Mean princess. That wasn't a fairy tale staple. Oh? Yep, but her bodyguard was in love with her and turned her good again. I felt disappointed. The story had a promising start. Blah! What did he do? Cast a spell? Give a true love's kiss? He died. Oh? Don't look so happy! That time I broke into a tiny laugh. But it made her, but it made her good again, right? Well, yeah, she didn't trust anyone before. Thought they were all fake and stuff. It seemed that she was glaring at me at that point of the story, but before I could open my mouth, she was already continuing. Anyway, the bodyguard sacrificed himself to save her life, so the heavens were super-duper impressed and put him in the stars. Aren't stars really, really hot? That sounds like a bad thing. Childish indignation flickered across her face. They made him into a constellation, you poop. Bleh. Bleh times infinity. Bleh times infinity plus. Anyway, the princess realized how beautiful love really is. Because he died. She saw how much he loved her, 
So she decided to be a better person and trust people again. It said nothing to do with writing messages on the dead lanterns. To the dead on lanterns. I was rapidly losing interest. Let me guess, she lived happily ever after. Well, no, the bodyguard died, remember? I like this bodyguard. She glared at me, but somehow felt less severe than before. She wrote her promise on a lantern and sent it up to the sky so he could see. Because he was a constellation, remember? Now I realize that I could have said a lot of things. That's stupid, he's dead, what could he do about it? But that wasn't on my mind at the time. Everyone turns into a bunch of stars when they die? Um, I think. You think or you know? If they did something to super duper impress the heavens, I guess? I smiled at that. My eyes scoured the street and landed on a simple booth. A handful of other kids were gathered around the short portable table, scrawling on lanterns with calligraphy pens clamped in fisted hands. Let's go! But I already made a lantern! Write you another dead person, then! With this overwhelming display of tact and political correctness, I raced toward the table, snatched a lantern from a smiling adult, and plopped down with my pen at the ready. Who are you writing to? None of your beeswax! I began to scroll characters on my lantern. The girl hovered over my shoulder, squinting judiciously at my jagged brushstrokes. Why is your handwriting so messy? It's not messy! Huh, I can't even read it! I whipped around, narrowing my eyes accusingly at her own lantern. Well, yours... I searched for a fault, but not only was her lantern graced with perfect calligraphy, it also proudly bore a few elegant cherry blossoms. Well, yours looks girly. She raised a single eyebrow. It was a remarkably sophisticated expression for a nine-year-old girl to make. I am a girl. And there was nothing much to say to that. Yeah, but where have you been? It was as if Rui had materialized out of thin air. I hadn't even noticed the rapid pitter-patter patter of her footsteps. Sorry, Rui. Jeez, could have told me. You were in the bathroom. Huh. Clearly displeased, Rui turned on her back to me, but smiled at the other girl. Thanks for taking care of him. Surprisingly, the girl smiled back, easy as you please. Well, weren't they getting along just fine? Why do they have to give me such a hard time? Maybe it was a girl thing. I'm Rui. I'm Masaki. You gonna make a lantern? Yep. How'd you make those flowers? They're really pretty. I can show you. And just like that, the two of them were friends. It took a little longer to warm me up, but whatever the two of them set their minds to, they accomplished. That had always been that way. So fiery, so capable, so lovely. Oh, they had always been like Two playful angels who, for some reason, unfathomable, unfathomable to mankind, saw fit to hang around a bucket of depressing sludge like me. Why do you think that about yourself? Mr. Ryota's voice seems to come from far in the distance. Faint, but recognizable. I respond distractedly. You know me, I'm not useful. Popular, particularly intelligent. Silence follows the statement, so I only continue. Our families were close. Masaki's father would always throw these get-togethers at the house over the weekend or during special occasions. I remember him being really overwhelming at first. He was a lot like Masaki, only bigger and louder. I rarely saw Misaki's mother. The times I did see her, she was pretty distant. Besides that, I really don't remember much about her. At first, we were inseparable, Misaki and us. But then her father had lost his job, and we started seeing less of her. And eventually, they just left. No warning whatsoever. Even her parents tried to get in contact. No luck. It had been as if the Kazaheyas had disappeared off the face of the planet. That must have been, really hard. Must have been a really hard blow. Rui says that it had been. Honestly, I don't remember much of what followed. It all passed in a haze. Essentially, I felt abandoned. I had this idea that everyone close to me would leave me. I don't think I could even cry. I only felt empty inside. But Rui says that it really was a terrible time. She says that I didn't eat, didn't sleep, didn't even play any games with her. She says that I look like a ghost. Heck, practically became one. And I don't remember it. But she says that one day... Yama, what's wrong? Nope. Sorry. That's it. Subs to hurry over. Are you sure? You do realize that the entire point of therapy is to share your sob stories. It's not a burden, Yama. I'm glad to hear you out. I... I feel tired. I think I'll have to stop here. It's mainly an excuse, and a very effective one for therapists. Mr. Ryota immediately nods in understanding. Thanks for confiding in me. Just know that what you felt was completely valid. I'm sorry you had that trauma. It's fine. I got over it. 
I'd like to go now, if that's okay. If you're sure. Is there anything I can do for you? I'm okay. You sure you don't want a lollipop? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, but thanks. Have a good day, Yama. <laughs> you want a lollipop? He's so freaking weird. But at least take this prescription. Prescription? Seriously? Then I actually look at it. One bucket of ice cream to be eaten guilt-free. Oh. As far as the administration knows, this is totally a legitimate treatment. Ice cream is one of the core groups of the food pyramid, you know. He actually pulls a genuine laugh out of me. Thanks, Mr. Iota. And thanks for listening. Anytime. Perfect place to end. All right. So, in, if as if you noticed when it was like, when he was talking and then it flipped, it looked like it was like a bottle of pills or something. So, I think what we're supposed to get from that is that, you know, he had a little suicidal moment. So, um, and I mean, like I've, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I've played this. So I kind of do know like why he was all grumpy at the festival, but that of course is going to come out later. So you will learn more about his story and like why the bus bothered him and all of that, like down the road and everything. And we learn more about Misaki and like why she left. And I kind of forget exactly why she left, but we will learn about it. So anyway, I'm going to wrap this part up here. I will see you guys next time. Remember to give the video a big thumbs up and subscribe to see more.